Hi everyone, my name is Murray Godfrey and I am Associate Professor of History at Central Oregon Community College and I am also a professor of my spare room in the, the COVID days. So I want to thank you all for uh, joining my uh, broadcast of this presentation that I'm sad we don't get to do in person because of circumstances, but we'll, we'll do as best we can here. And I just want to remind everyone before we get started, if you're interested in the information in this program, if you're interested in history, if you're interested in any wide variety of academic uh, or career and technical subjects, I, I recommend you look into taking a, a class at COCC. You can either look into our continuing ed program, which is, which is geared for adults, or uh, look into taking a regular uh, credit class, which if you are young, or young at heart, you get uh, tuition comp. So if you're a recent high school graduate, uh, you get your tuition comped from, or free from the uh, state of Oregon. Or if you're a senior citizen age 65 or older, uh, you also get free tuition at Oregon Community Colleges. So I, I recommend you, you take a look into that if you're interested. So now let's, let's get into the subject matter. All right, so here we go. So this uh, talk is going to be about uh, Richard Nixon, a little bit of his background, uh, and then the Watergate scandal and its, its impact. So Richard Nixon uh, grew up as a kind of lower middle class guy. Uh, he called himself poor. They, they weren't exactly poor, but they certainly weren't uh, well off, uh, the Nixon family. He grew up in Southern California. And uh, his family was Quaker, and so he grew up very reserved. So even go, I've got this uh, picture of him uh, from his football days at Whittier College when he played on the second string of the football team. He actually wasn't very athletic. Uh, he, he wasn't allowed to play sports that much when he was younger uh, by his parents. Wasn't allowed to do a lot of things. Couldn't drink, couldn't smoke, uh, wasn't supposed to speak up real loud, all, all of that, like kind of the strict Quaker upbringing. Uh, so as a result, he always had this kind of introverted nature uh, to his, his personality. Uh, he was very smart, though. Uh, this one thing I think Nixon doesn't get enough credit for uh, is that he was extremely intelligent. He did really well at college, worked really hard uh, all through school. Uh, he would have gone off to college earlier instead of staying at home and going to Whittier had he been able to, but he had to take care of, uh, help take care of one of his sick uh, siblings. So he eventually did go off to law school where he graduated pretty high in the class. If I recall correctly, he was like second in the class or something at Duke Law School. And then he came back to uh, California and uh, uh, started working as a lawyer. And uh, he also uh, married his, his sweetheart, Pat. So... He did uh, have a stint of service during World War II. You can see his uh, Navy portrait there. He uh, was in the Naval Reserve and was uh, sent uh, to the Pacific. He never saw action, but he was uh, a competent officer and worked his way up the ranks. Uh, he was involved in uh, logistics and uh, worked at one of the supply depots uh, for the Navy in the uh, Pacific operations. And so he, he distinguished himself there. And then he came back to the States and uh, back to Southern California. And uh, why he was chosen to run for Congress, there's a couple of different competing theories, but uh, he ran for Congress in 1946, which was a good Republican year. And... Uh, the Republicans in California's 12th district, which uh, at that time encompassed uh, kind of suburb, exurban Los Angeles, uh, Pasadena, uh, Pomona, and, and some of that area. The Republicans were looking for someone to uh, run against uh, a Democrat named Jerry Voorhees, who 
was one of the highest profile Democrats who resided in a district or represented a district that was uh, more Republican than it should have been for a Democrat. So they, uh, the Republicans have always been split in various ways and they, in the years before that, that's why they weren't able to get a good, uh, uh, candidate to defeat Voorhees. And then they decided they came to a consensus around Nixon and uh, he had some friends that he knew from Whittier and, or Whittier college. And, uh, they promoted him as a nominee for Congress. He ended up winning and, uh, made a name for himself pretty quick. So the case in of Alger Hiss was, uh, that Hiss was a state department official who had, uh, been accused by a guy named Whitaker Chambers, who was uh, an ex-communist who kind of became this this right-wing celebrity, uh, accused Hiss of being one of the people in the government who was secretly a communist and also a Soviet spy. And it was alleged that Hiss had uh, been a spy for the government, especially when he was at the Yalta conference as part of the delegation uh, that worked with Franklin Roosevelt at the meeting between uh, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin uh, at the end of World War, toward the end of World War II. So Nixon quickly got himself on the House on American Activities Committee and established himself as one of the uh, most prominent Cold Warriors. Uh, his personal politics, we actually don't know um, what exactly he thought about a lot of issues. He tended to move. Uh, politically where he thought it was the most advantageous. And so exactly how conservative or liberal he was on a variety of issues, we actually don't know because uh, he would shift uh, quite a lot. But the one issue that he didn't change on is that he was uh, a strong anti-communist just for the sake of it, really. Uh, very much for... Uh, America's interest vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And so if there were any communist spies, Nixon wanted to root him out, and he felt that that was one of the uh, number one threats facing uh, facing America were these uh, communists who, who were in the government and ready to give up all kinds of secrets or whatever and help lose the Cold War. Strength in the Cold War and uh, rooting out communists domestically, that was something that was kind of Nixon's calling card. And uh, he quickly made a name for himself. They didn't get Hiss on the spying charges, but they did get him on uh, perjury. And uh, he, he was uh, convicted of that. And uh, Nixon's uh, reputation got, uh, became nationally famous. So when Eisenhower was looking for a running mate, he didn't really care who his running mate was. Um, and so there were a variety of uh, prominent Republican politicians that the Republicans looked at uh, as a potential running mate for, for Dwight Eisenhower in 1952. And who looked like a uh, pretty good option was Richard Nixon. And so he was... Uh, chosen as the vice presidential nominee. Eisenhower's fine with that. They didn't have, Eisenhower and Nixon didn't have a very close relationship. Um, they kind of tolerated each other, even though their domestic politics were probably pretty similar. Uh, although I, Nixon was far more, much more of the cold warrior um, in terms of his uh, zealousness on that. Uh, he became... It was considered necessary to balance out the ticket with someone who was uh, uh, very anti-communist and very, very uh, uh, strict on those issues, since there was some allegations uh, in conservative quarters that Eisenhower had been uh, uh, compromised when he was in Europe uh, by communists or what have you. So Nixon was brought on the ticket to balance that out. Uh, he became prominent, or his most famous moment of the 1952 campaign, campaign was what was, called, what was called the checker speech. The uh, political opposition tried to 
alleged that Nixon had taken bribes uh, in, in his time in Congress. And Nixon went on uh, TV and gave this impassioned speech about uh, integrity in his uh, work in, in politics. And he did say, well, I... I did accept uh, a gift one time, a little dog that someone gave us. Uh, dog's name was Checkers, and my wife and, and daughter uh, love the dog, and I'm not going to give uh, give the dog up. And uh, that actually kind of was a an interesting show of warmth from him, and uh, he got good marks from the press for it. During the the 1950s, his uh, vice presidency was mostly focused on you know, diplomacy and uh, managing uh, affairs regarding the Cold War. Uh, he 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 continued as vice president to try to prosecute the Cold War aggressively. Probably his most famous moment was uh, in 1959 when he had the so-called kitchen debate with. Uh, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, in which uh, when Khrushchev visited the U.S., one of the events that he engaged in was this visit to a test kitchen, which was televised, and uh, it was part of a, of an event that showcased a lot of new uh, technology. And Nixon got into it with Khrushchev and uh, said, you know, well, maybe you're ahead of us on some things, but we're ahead of you on other things. And really demonstrated himself to uh, conservatives at the time that he was willing to stand toe to toe with uh, the most prominent communist in the world and tell him, you know, life is better in the U.S. because we have these things in our kitchens, uh, these appliances, and your people don't have these. And Nixon, and he kind of got Khrushchev flustered. His flus uh, Khrushchev's response was, "No, no, we have just as good things as this." And he he seemed kind of. Uh, taken aback and it made it was kind of a strong moment for Nixon. Then Nixon as the vice president uh, of the outgoing Eisenhower administration was naturally chosen by the Republican National Committee to be the presidential candidate although there was some controversy Nixon was always distrusted by the strongest conservatives and uh, there was a significant effort to uh, replace him on the ticket with Barry Goldwater in 1960. In any case, Nixon did win that uh, primary and faced off against John F. Kennedy in the 1960 election. And uh, this is something that uh, is interesting historically. The election was extremely close and it's popularly noted that in, in the presidential debates, which were the first televised presidential debates, uh, in American elections that Nixon looked bad and Kennedy looked good. And the, the, f the first debate just so happened to be on a day when Nixon was getting over the flu and didn't feel very well. And he, he still had a fever and uh, was sweating and he just didn't look good. And Kennedy, on the other hand, was kind of enjoying the best health of his life, uh, which normally <laughs> his health was pretty bad. Kennedy uh, had, John F. Kennedy had terrible health most of his life. He was pumped up with a lot of drugs and steroids at this particular time, and he had just gotten on a new drug that helped his uh, his various pain and back problems, and uh, he had also been outdoors a lot lately, so he, his, his skin looked better. And so Kennedy looked great, and he was already a decent-looking guy, but he looked great, and his weight was good. He, he, just a few years prior, he had been really skinny from, from being so sick. Uh, he had put on some weight and looked better. Uh, and uh, Nixon just looked old and, and tired, even though he wasn't. They were the same age. I think Nixon's a year older than Kennedy. But uh, Nixon ended up losing that election very closely, and the debate performance uh, perception was is one reason historians think why, uh, but there are a variety of other reasons. In any case... The election was so close, Nixon took it really personally, and uh, he could have fought the election results since there were some discrepancies in the ballot counting in, in a couple states, but uh, Nixon chose not to do that. He went on to run for governor of California in 1962, 
and uh, lost that election as well. And then he he really became resentful of the press. He believed that the press was against him, even though the press interestingly kind of made him when he was part of HUAC uh, earlier in his career. But he, he w- became convinced that there was this uh, vicious uh, strain in the press that had it out for him personally. And uh, he, he never quite got over that. An example of Nixon's combativeness with the press came at the uh, at the end of the Cal- California gubernatorial campaign in 1962, when uh, Nixon was basically blaming the press, and uh, he got upset with them and said, "Well, you should be happy you don't have Nixon to kick around anymore." For Sixteen years, ever since the Hiss case, you've had a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of fun. Uh, you, you, you've, you've had an opportunity to, uh, to attack me, and I think I've given as good as I've taken. I leave you gentlemen now, <laughs> and uh, you will now write it, you will interpret it, that's your right. But as I leave you, uh, I want you to know, <laughs> just think how much you're going to be missing. You don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. Because, gentlemen, This is my last press conference, and I hope that what I have said today will at least make television, radio, the press recognize that they have a right and a responsibility. If they're against a candidate, give him the shaft, but also recognize if they give him the shaft, put one lonely reporter on the campaign who will report what the candidate says now and then. Thank you, gentlemen. But Nixon was not done. He said he was done in 1962, but he definitely was not. Uh, He ended up making this big comeback in 1968. Uh, What helped a lot was the uh, Republican loss in in 1964 uh, when Barry Goldwater ran against Lyndon Johnson. And uh, so the party kind of re-coalesced around Nixon, thinking that kind of candidate was more effective. And they ended up being proven right. Uh, Nixon learned a lot from his two prior losses and he uh, focused a lot more on his, his propaganda for lack of a, a better term or his, uh, his image that was getting put out in the media. And, uh, he ran a very effective campaign with this, uh, slogan that said this time vote like your whole world depended on it. And he made an appeal to what he called the silent majority, which uh, in his mind were the people who didn't like all the protests, didn't want to lose in Vietnam, uh, but also wanted Vietnam to be run better. And uh, Nixon made that argument effectively. Uh, 1968 election was pretty close. Uh, Electorally, uh, Nixon won pretty well, but the popular vote was he only won by 0.5 percent, uh, half a percent, and against the Democratic nominee Hubert Humphrey, uh, who was the sitting vice president under Lyndon Johnson, and uh, Nixon never forgot that, and that was also something he carried with him: is that even though he did about as good a job as he thought he could in 1968, he still barely won, or at least in his mind, barely won. So uh, he carried that chip on his shoulder as well. So, uh, but it was an amazing comeback and uh, he he got elected, elected president and carried with him a lot of the people who had uh, worked with him closely since those early campaigns in uh, 19, in the early, in in 1960 and 62 uh, for president and then governor Uh, Two of his closest aides that he developed relationships with were uh, two guys named John Ehrlichman and uh, H.R. Haldeman, and uh, they became prominent White House advisors uh, when Nixon became president. So if Watergate had never happened, Nixon probably would be considered one of the most successful presidents of the 20th century. Um, 
in foreign policy, uh, that was probably what he was most proud of and where most of his uh, strongest accomplishments lie. Uh, he managed to tamp down the Cold War somewhat and started the whole detente process, uh, which uh, had been in place really, or had, there had been efforts to make the Cold War less intense uh, and less existential in terms of uh, blowing each other up or blowing the whole world up with nuclear weapons. Ever since the Cuban Missile Crisis, there had been efforts from both uh, the Soviet side and the U.S. side to at least uh, hold down the rhetoric a bit and uh, think a little bit more before making rash decisions. And that process continued under Nixon. Uh, it was under Nixon that uh, he made a trip to the Soviet Union and signed the Strategic Arms Limitations Treaty, which started putting uh, some upper bounds on how many uh, nuclear weapons the countries would produce. He also uh, made diplomatic overtures to China. And uh, what he considered his biggest accomplishment, and rightly so, was getting China reopened, getting its economy reopened to the world, and uh, diplomatic relations uh, reopened to the U.S. Uh, that had been basically closed ever since the Chinese Communist Revolution in 1949. So uh, that was considered an incredible success. And Nixon had a number of successes domestically as well that liberals would give him uh, props for if they didn't hate him so much. Uh, for example, creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, enforcement of various civil rights codes, uh, affirmative action. Uh, Nixon, like I said before, we don't quite know what his personal beliefs were on domestic issues because... Uh, he did what he thought was the most politically prudent. And when that meant working with liberals, that meant working with liberals. Personally, he would denigrate liberals and, and call them names and uh, curse about them. But publicly, he would work with them, even environmentalists or feminists, uh, when, when he needed to. They didn't give him a whole lot of credit for that, but he did do it, which probably upset conservatives in the Republican Party more than it uh, made liberals happy in the in the Democratic Party since uh, his anti-Cold War or his anti-communist rhetoric, his Cold War rhetoric was something that liberals had trouble forgiving and also his Vietnam policies. But in any case, Nixon had a highly successful first term. His job approval rate uh, never went below 48 percent and generally was in the high 50s range, around 60 percent most of the first term. So as a result, Nixon was awarded with a massive re-election victory. Um, here he is with uh, uh, Vice President Spiro Agnew celebrating the victory. Um, they were overwhelmingly successful in that election. The Democrats had a debacle of a convention in 1972 where the they had trouble choosing a vice president for a uh, nominee for George McGovern. Uh, McGovern just made a, a series of mistakes and uh, it came off as really incompetent and it just uh, was an overwhelming landslide. On the popular vote, it doesn't look quite as bad of a landslide, but electorally, I mean, the whole map was, was painted red, although ironically uh, they used... Uh, well, it was black and white in most TVs, but the political scientists actually used blue uh, back then for Republicans, but now we use red. So the 72 election went really well. And so the big question historians have, or any of us who are studying this, this issue here, why would Nixon cheat? to try to win the election when he basically couldn't lose. He was really strong going into the 1972 election season. Uh, his, his best accomplishments happened in the first half of 1972, the visits to uh, the Soviet Union and China. And so he was getting more positive press than ever before. So why would he put that at risk in the summer of 1972? Why would he cheat? Uh, and the cheating which ended up causing the Watergate scandal in his ultimate resignation. So the reason for that uh, 
is because Nixon was one of our, what I call quote unquote, angry presidents. We don't have too many of these, uh, although we should understand now that we kind of do. Um, but Nixon, Andrew Johnson, uh, Donald Trump, what these presidents shared was uh, an anger against the press, especially uh, against the, the public sentiment of their image, and they never forgot that. And so Nixon was somewhat unique among high-profile politicians in that he didn't like people. <laughs> he was introverted. He, he liked being by himself. He liked reading. He liked thinking. He liked writing. Um, didn't like dealing with people that much, even his own wife. And uh, he, he was somewhat distant from her. So his paranoia and his resentments just got worse and worse. He never forgave the 1960 uh, resentments. And some of that was legitimate in that the press loved John F. Kennedy. I mean, loved. We, we talk about the press being biased today, but it, before the uh, 1960s, the press actually kind of tended to lean Republican, usually. In the 1930s, for example, the press tended to be uh, anti-Roosevelt. But uh, since the owners of the press generally tend to be Republican businessmen. And... Uh, Hollywood got more and more friendly with the press in the 1930s through 50s in the New Deal era, but uh, where they got really friendly because Kennedy kind of had this Hollywood glamour to him, and he was also very open with the press. Kennedy talked to the press a lot, and uh, they loved him for giving him the access and uh, he talked really candidly with reporters, had a way of, of having rapport with them. So uh, the press legitimately treated Kennedy really well. And Nixon never forgave that. He always thought there was this bias against him and this irrational uh, praise of Kennedy that uh, caused him to lose the 1960 election. And uh, never for, he was always paranoid about you know, how badly they treated him in, in the debate and how unfair it was. And so he never got over that resentment. And you'd see this resentment and this vindictiveness come out a number of times uh, in, in the Nixon years. Uh, so he was prone to pushing the envelope when it came to doing what it need what he needed to to win, prompting journalist Hunter S. Thompson to say, uh, "Jesus, how low do you have to stoop in this country to be president?" Uh, writing about the 1972 election, so Nixon was willing to do whatever it took to win, and he didn't think the press would ever accept him. And or they, they they had such a personal animosity against him. He thought uh, he he was willing to take whatever measures necessary to secure a win. And so he didn't only just want to win the 1972 election. He wanted to win big to prove something to all of them, uh, all the people who doubted him. So one of the few presidents we've had. Most presidents try to either be calm or um, be affable. So like calmness, like, like Barack Obama, kind of affability, like Ronald Reagan or Franklin Roosevelt, uh, kind of happy warrior type. Nixon wasn't. Nixon was like uh, an angry person. And uh, he, 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 had, he carried these chips on his shoulder and uh, certainly did in this case. And so that's what caused him to get into trouble with Watergate. He had a um, reputation of being uh, Trixie. Uh, he, had, he had a nickname, Tricky Dick. And uh, you can see they were trying to exploit this against him in 1960. Would you buy a used car from this man? I don't know. He looks kind of creepy there. And uh, a way, an example of how his tricks would work. He was willing to stoop to any level to win an election. So in his 1950 campaign against, uh, in, in, the, in California for Senate, uh, when he became a senator for a couple of years, he ran against a woman named Helen, Helen Gahagan Douglas. And she uh, was a former actress and kind of a classic New Deal politician. And Nixon circulated a handbill called uh, uh, the uh, Pink Slip, which uh, cataloged uh, her supposed connections with communism. And he said she was pink down to her underwear. 
and uh, you can see the lipstick down there at the bottom of this uh, flyer. So it, clearly kind of using kind of sexual offensiveness as well as, as just lies uh, uh, on her position against uh, the Korean War and, and so forth. And so Nixon ended up winning that Senate election due to these underhanded, uh, essentially propaganda tactics, and he got the reputation of being tricky dick after that. In the 1968 election, he was willing to stoop to whatever it took. And so this only came out, uh, or was only confirmed in uh, the 2010s when an author who just recently, a couple years ago, wrote a new book on, on Nixon using sources from the Nixon Library, uh, discovered that it was true, the rumors of Nixon trying to pressure f uh, foreign interests to uh, change the election outcome in the U.S. And so... What Nixon had done in 1968 was uh, encourage and authorize uh, members of what was the so-called China lobby in uh, the U.S. It were people with Republican connections who also had connections with uh, various Asian politicians. Nixon authorized them. One of them was a woman named Anna Chenault to uh, pressure the South Vietnamese government to not accept any peace negotiations uh, with North Vietnam until the United States uh, behaved differently, essentially. And so uh, in October of 1968, President Lyndon Johnson was trying to work out a negotiation that would lead to a peace treaty and was hoping to announce that before the 1968 election uh, that would essentially end the war in Vietnam eventually. And Nixon's activities ended up pressuring the right people who connected with the South Vietnamese government, President uh, Nguyen Van, Van Tu, and uh, convinced them not to accept the uh, peace feelers. And so they were unwilling, the South Vietnamese government was unwilling to uh, negotiate peace, and the, the talks fell apart. And so what's kind of tragic about this is it extended the Vietnam War several more years than it needed to be. And Nixon was willing to work with a foreign power in order to win, win the election. Lyndon Johnson's intelligence people knew about this because they had the South Vietnamese uh, uh, presidential palace bugged. And so they, they, had, they, they had the information, but they, couldn't, they didn't have it in such a way that could prove it to the public. And so Johnson decided not to go public with the knowledge that uh, Nixon had worked with foreign interests to undermine or, or, or to affect the election process. So he was willing to do what it took, essentially. Nixon became very concerned during his presidency about the release of the Pentagon Papers, which was a leak of a 7,000-page document by a defense analyst named Daniel Ellsberg, uh, when the Nixon tapes during the Watergate scandal were released, Nixon called Ellsberg the most dangerous man in America. Uh, Nixon tried to, the Nixon administration tried to sue uh, Ellsberg uh, and sue, uh, saying that he had uh, committed crimes in releasing the documentation to the New York Times, which kind of released it piece by piece. And essentially what the Docu the Pentagon Papers said uh, were that the Vietnam War wasn't going as well as uh, anyone thought or that the government was saying and uh, that the government knew Vietnam was going to be hard to win much earlier than it ever admitted that to the public. So uh, Nixon considered leakers like Ellsberg to be the most dangerous people to the government. He, he saw this as kind of you know, Cold War game playing that this was going to help the U.S. lose the Cold War if it has these kinds of disclosures. And so Nixon wanted to stop this kind of thing from happening again, and if he could, try to discredit Ellsberg. This coincided with the creation of what was called CREEP, the <laughs> Committee for the Re-Election of the President. On the surface, CREEP was a... Uh, subdivision of the Nixon re-election campaign and made up of a variety of political advisors. But in reality, it was a uh, an office that controlled money 
uh, and that was kind of provided a slush fund and uh, money laundering services for illegal campaign donations. Uh, there were laws against accepting donations from corporations and things like that. And what Creep did was allow Nixon to accept uh, those doc the, uh, donations from rich people that he was he was that were supposed to be legal. Uh, and there are also some more underhanded parts to creep, including uh, intelligence operations. It was made up of a lot of f poor former CIA people. Uh, and so intelligence operations against the political opponents and even an assassination plot uh, or a couple assassination plots, one of them uh, against a, a journalist who uh, had information on uh, Cold War activities that the Nixon administration was doing in Latin America. Uh, there was some discussion of assassinating that reporter. It didn't actually happen. But uh, the members of Creep were kind of a combination of these underhanded people and of uh, just kind of Republican activists. And they shared the culture, the Nixonian culture of doing what it took, whatever it took to win an election. Okay, so out of Creep came a subunit within it called the Plumbers. And these were paid by Creep but a lot of them were working for the White House. So they were called the plumbers because their job was to stop leaks. Ha. Uh, they were a covert team designed to discredit potential leakers or actual leakers like Daniel Ellsberg. And uh, when they didn't do so well at that, they moved on to political, political espionage. In information warfare and here we see the filing cabinet that changed history um, the plumbers first operation when they were formed in, in 1971 was to break into the offices of a psychiatrist named Lewis Fielding in uh, California and break into the files and try to find something in Ellsberg's files that would discredit him uh, they didn't find anything useful in the files. What they were hoping to find was information that Ellsberg had divulged to his psychiatrist that would indicate what other information he knew. And so what they were hoping that he had some said to his doctor, you know, oh, I know about this, and I'm, gonna, I'm thinking about releasing this information next, and that's, they didn't find it. So uh, in an ironic twist, had the plumbers succeeded in finding something that could have damaged Ellsberg in those files, uh, they would have uh, probably not gotten into too much of the political side of uh, Creep's operations. Had they been caught, uh, they would have been quickly disbanded, or had, they, had Ellsberg's lawyers found out about who they were and divulged that information, they would have been disbanded before Watergate ever happened. But as in a quirk, uh, their failure to find what they wanted but not getting caught just kind of continued their operations as this subunit of creep. Uh, not all these guys on the side here were members of the plumbers. Chuck Colson there was a high White House aide. Uh, Howard Hunt uh, was the uh, security coordinator for creep. Uh, G. Gordon Liddy was uh, also one of the uh, one of the creep operatives, and, and James McCord, uh, one of the actual burglars. So now Watergate gets complicated, and I'm going to try to do my best, and I, I'm going to use a lot more words here on my slides, a lot more text uh, than I usually use to try to keep sense of all this, and I'll, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible, but Watergate was a very complicated uh, who done it and who knows whom kind of affair, and it's very easy to get caught up in those weeds. So where the story really starts is May of 1972. The plumbers break into the Democratic National Committee offices at the Watergate complex, which is uh, in the Foggy Bottom area of Washington, D.C. So what the goal here was, was to find something that the 
Republicans could use against the Democrats, the Nixon campaign could use against the Democrats. We don't know exactly what they were looking for. We think maybe they were trying to uh, find some damaging information on the on the DNC chair at the time, who was uh, someone that was problematic for Nixon. But uh, so they planted these listening devices in the offices, and basically what they discovered was just a bunch of uh, office gossip. And uh, the unit of the plumbers was stationed in the hotel, the Watergate Hotel across the street, and would listen to the bug all the time. And then a bug malfunctions, and on June 17th of 1972, some members of the plumbers, dressed up as burglars, uh, are assigned to fix the broken listening device. And they break in to the Watergate complex, into the DNC offices, and... Uh, try to fix the bug, and instead they're arrested. Uh, a security guard walks by a door uh, where he noticed some tape that had been taped over the door lock, and he knew that the cleaning the, the cleaning crew had already gone home, and so it wasn't the cleaning crew that would have done that, so the security guard called the police, and the police showed up and uh, found those the, the, the five members of the plumbers and arrested them. So they initially just said, oh, we're, we're burglars. They, they didn't say a whole lot. The case was turned over to the FBI for suspected money laundering or counterfeiting, since the, the, burglars, the five burglars had a bunch of cash on them. And so why would you be breaking in to an apartment or, or to an office if you already had a bunch of cash? There's something fishy going on here. Uh, so the police turned the case over to the FBI, since it was related to the federal government being the Democratic National Committee offices. And the Washington Post assigns two beat reporters, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, to cover the story. So there's the complex as it looked in 1972, and then here's the, uh, uh, the plumbers. The, the highest ranking of them would have been uh, McCord who's uh, second from the left there. The rest of them were veterans from uh, the CIA, many of, most of, all of whom had been involved in the failed uh, coup attempt against, uh, against Fidel Castro in 1961, the Bay of Pigs uh, affair. And so one of the reasons the cover-up happened is because Nixon wanted to not open up the, the whole Bay of Pigs fiasco again, and uh, for, for Cold War reasons. So over the next few months, uh, the tenacity of the Washington Post reporters is essentially what caused the scandal to get worse, but also uh, information uh, discovered at the crime scene and from the burglars themselves. So the burglars were found to have some written material on them. One of them was a notebook or an address book that had a variety of phone numbers in it. One of, one of the numbers was a White House number with the label HH, which meant Howard Hunt. And uh, Howard Hunt had worked in the White House. And the, uh, the number, when the authorities called it, or, or when the reporters called the number, it went straight to the White House. And so... Uh, they called these numbers, one of whom, one of the numbers was Howard Hunt's number, and uh, the reporters asked Hunt, uh, why is your phone number, <laughs> they called him and literally asked him, why is your phone number uh, in the notebook of these Watergate burglars? And the response was just, oh my God, and hung up. And so something was fishy here. And so that, that caused Woodward and Bernstein to stick with the story because of these connections with the White House. So the story was only interesting to the extent that it occurred at the Democratic National Committee. And it got more interesting as these connections to the White House uh, became clear. So the reporters found a variety of things. Uh, it was a story that went on for two more years, but uh, among the things they discovered in the first few months, there was a large cashier's check from Creep that had been deposited into uh, one of the burglar's accounts, or bank accounts. So what were they doing with this money? It was a huge check, uh, $25,000. They discovered that the Nixon campaign had a dirty tricks campaign that was run by Attorney General John Mitchell, who later resigned and then had to do jail time for his illegal activity. Uh, 
and it was divulged through sources that the FBI knew that the break-in was related to creep activity. So uh, that reporting continued for a long time, and there were many sources. The most prominent source was a uh, or was, was the deputy director of the FBI, Mark Felt, who was uh, not named by the reporters, but uh, was called uh, Deep Throat was was the nickname because he was in deep cover, uh, meaning not divulging the source's identity. And uh, Bob Woodward would meet with Felt at this parking garage in, in Northern Virginia, Rossland, Virginia. And Felt was the one who would give the information to kind of keep the reporters on the trail, um, you know, look into this, look into that. Uh, he never actually said, follow the money. That was actually something said by the movie uh, that came out a couple of years later. But uh, the financial connections were something that the that, that led Woodrow and Bernstein to discover more and more about the illegal activity and connection to the White House. So at the time, the White House's response was basically all, this is nothing. We had nothing to do with this. John Dean, who was White House counsel, was, was put in charge of a White House investigation, which basically said... Uh, there's no connection between the White House and any of this uh, third-rate burglary business. But there was. The trial of the Watergate burglars for conspiracy and for burglary, since they found all the wiretapping stuff uh, in the offices, took place in, uh, in January of 1973. And uh, most of the burglars pled guilty, except for G. Gordon Liddy, uh, and uh, James McCord, they tried to hold out and plead not guilty, but they were eventually convicted anyway, along with the ones who pled guilty. The judge in the case, John Sirica, this is kind of an example of judicial activism here, but Sirica was convinced that there was more to this and something was really fishy and that there were people in high places doing illegal activity. So Sirica threatened all of the all the defendants that they are going to get the maximum sentence possible. This is something he did a lot. He was called Maximum John. Uh, they were going to get the maximum sentence possible if they did not talk, specifically about who pays their legal bills. They said they didn't know who was paying their legal bills, and Liddy and McCord refused to say who was paying, even if they did know. So that pressure, though, eventually worked. And by March, M James McCord wrote a confession that didn't name people specifically, but said there was a wider conspiracy. And uh, the confession was read aloud in court by Sirica during the sentencing in March of 1973. And that's when this story really blew up because the confession said this burglary had to do with people high up in the government. That was essentially what the confession said. And uh, it's being paid for by people higher up in the government. And Sirica basically called on the, the Congress, the House and the Senate, to start investigating what's going on, why these burglars are connected, or what these burglars are connected to, and who is, who is behind all this. So in April of 1973, the Congress took Sirica's uh, statement pretty seriously, and both the House and the Senate started uh, investigations. And the Senate investigation was the most dramatic, and uh, this whole time, the White House is trying to deflect and deny and uh, stonewall. And the, the White House says, we didn't have anything to do with this. We're not connected to this at all, even though it became more and more clear from the trial that there were connections between these burglars and members of the Nixon campaign, including some people that work in the White House. And so now the question becomes, what did the president know? Was the president involved in ordering burglaries and other illegal activities? So the, the famous moment uh, in the Senate hearing came... Uh, in 1973 when Tennessee Senator Howard Baker I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency and if the cancer was not removed the president himself would be killed by it I also told him that it was important that this cancer be removed immediately because it was growing more deadly every day the central question at this point is simply put 
What did the president know, and when did he know it? John Dean, who was the White House counsel in charge of trying to put the Watergate affair under wraps, he ends up working with the committees and basically tells them everything he knew. And everything he knew was quite a lot uh, since he had been basically in charge of the cover-up. Uh, after the Watergate burglary happened, what the Nixon administration started doing was to find ways to lie and interfere with the investigation to try to derail it. And Dean basically said it was his job to try to manage that. The question, though, what did the president know and when did he know it? That question wasn't quite answerable, and that was kind of the key question here. So by the spring, the trial and the reporting had involved that people heavily involved were H.R. Haldeman, the White House chief of staff, and John Ehrlichman, uh, one of Nixon's closest advisors. These had been guys who had been with Nixon since the early 60s, also veterans of the FBI CIA. So uh, the hearings uncovered more and more of, of the Nixon administration's, quote, dirty tricks. And uh, this, called, this caused the attorney general to resign. Um, and then a new attorney general was appointed by Nixon, and this new attorney general appoints a special prosecutor. So now, by the spring of 1973, spring, summer, there's two investigations, or three, if you want, depending on what you want to count the House is doing. So there's, there's the Senate investigation, and then the, the special prosecutor, Department of Justice investigation. At this point, Nixon gives a press conference saying he's innocent, but... Uh, there were some staff members doing things that he didn't know about, and uh, they may be at fault, but it had nothing to do with him. That didn't end the issue. Uh, it, it came back the next month. More of the investigations occur in the Congress. They call up. There's a rumor of a taping system, and the Senate calls up some other White House aides, including a secretary named Alexander Butterfield, and they ask him for hours a whole bunch of questions. And then toward the very end, they ask him, did you know about any kind of recording devices? And he was under oath and he had to say, yes, I knew about a recording device. So it turns out Nixon had been using and actually had expanded a taping program in the White House. And the, the purpose of it for him was uh, to help him write his memoirs when he was out of office and... Uh, just for kind of his own personal aggrandizement. Uh, there had been a taping system going back to the 1940s. Franklin Roosevelt had first used one, and then most of the presidents had used it at various times. Lyndon Johnson used it quite a lot to kind of keep track of what he said and when. Uh, but the existence of these tapes was a bombshell, and so it was a secret thing, and now there's this revelation, and... Uh, the Senate investigators say, well, if there's tapes, we want them because these tapes, if, if you're recording all your conversations in the White House, then we'll know one way or another whether or not you authorize this burglary and authorize the cover up of the investigations of the burglary. So both the Senate and the special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, subpoena the tapes. Nixon gives another televised address saying that he's innocent and refuses to give up any tapes. Uh, his argument is his argument changed several times. At first, he argued there was personal property, which was kind of true in the beginning. And then uh, he later argued it was presidential privilege to not have to give up these uh, this documentation. So for months, this went on. It kind of died down for a little bit and then came back. So October of 1973 was the big uh, kind of the big turning point in the scandal. Things were happening that made Nixon look bad. One of them was uh, the revelation that his vice president, Spear Agnew, had been engaged in bribes and tax evasion, and that caused him to have to resign. Nixon replaced Spear Agnew with Gerald Ford. Uh, Nixon, in October of 1973, offers Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox transcripts of the tapes that would be produced by the White House itself. Cox says no, they want the actual tapes, and that's what they subpoenaed. Uh, Nixon responds to that by saying, we're going to fire Cox, and he can't fire the special prosecutor because it doesn't work directly for the president, so the attorney general has to fire him. So Nixon tries to order the attorney general to fire the special prosecutor. The attorney general says no. Uh, 
The assistant attorney general also says no. They both resign. Finally, the third in line at the Justice Department, uh, Solicitor General Robert Bork fires uh, Archibald Cox. And then a new special prosecutor is appointed, and uh, the investigation just continues, and Nixon continues to stonewall using a variety of excuses about presidential privilege and whatnot for why he shouldn't give up the tapes. Uh, It was in that context the following month that Nixon said, I am not a crook at a televised press conference in uh, Florida. And I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes, but in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think too that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. I love just the stance of defiance that he takes. I mean, it's so it's so Nixonian, like the crossing his arms and kind of moving on the on his heels like that. Um, just his the anger that just comes across uh, since he would get angry when the press would ask him uh, too many questions about Watergate. So that just kind of that coming on a, a month after the vice president had to resign for tax evasion, it just made the whole administration look really corrupt. And, and by this time, the Dirty Tricks campaign was well known and it was just making the PR really bad for Dixon. It was hard for him to be able to claim we did the right thing when it's clear that he had done the wrong things at so many different times, um, breaking law just for the sake of it in some cases, doing what he, whatever he felt needed, uh, a lot of cases unnecessary. So that same month, November 1973, the White House agrees to start transcripting the tapes, and then they have to reveal that, oops, we erased 18 minutes of tape. And uh, it just so happens to come from the crucial period, which was June 1972. And the blame went to the president's personal secretary, Rosemary Woods, um, in which she uh, claimed that she accidentally pressed the record button with her foot, which uh, blanked over about 18 minutes worth of tape. And you can see the the picture where they reenacted how the mistake took place here. Uh, the press called it the Rosemary Stretch, and this was something the White House put out where they 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 it must have been so embarrassing for her to have her reenact this uh, th- this this action of grabbing the phone and, and and stretching her leg out and accidentally hitting the the button which is on the floor with you pressed with your foot to uh, of the tape recorder and so the rosemary stretch um wasn't a very convincing explanation of why the 18 minutes of tape were released in reality uh, it was really those 18 minutes were purposefully erased and so they had tampered with evidence in the federal investigation the next few months uh things just kind of become worse and worse for nixon as more and more negative information comes out um the House of Representatives began impeachment proceedings by the late spring. Nixon released transcripts of the tapes, but what those transcripts revealed was just how angry and vindictive and nasty he could be. Nixon tried to put out somewhat of a uh, a reserved image to the and dignified image in public, but in private, what these transcripts released is just how petty and. Uh, how willing he was to use the government to try to hurt people. Uh, He was so paranoid about his supposed enemies and he had this enemies list and uh, had something like 200 people on it, most of whom were political opponents and also members of the press and also a number of Hollywood figures such as Paul Newman, the actor who ended up being pleasantly surprised he was on the list. Um, But the transcript revealed that Nixon would say stuff like, uh, you know, against private citizens, uh, actors or or journalists who had done something he didn't like, 
uh, would say, we need to scrub their tax returns and then we're going to screw them. Uh, he, he would say stuff like that that came out on the transcripts and it just put a bad taste in everyone's mouth about what kind of man he was or what, what he was willing to be uh, when, it, uh, when it was necessary. So the whole thing came to a head in July of 1974. The Senate had sued Nixon for the tapes. In July, the Supreme Court ruled that Nixon had to turn over the tapes. The executive privilege wasn't uh, appropriate here. And when the tapes were finally turned over, uh, the, the quote-unquote smoking gun was revealed uh, from a recording from six days after the burglary, July 23rd, in which Nixon ordered aides to inter intervene in the investigations uh, that the FBI was conducting. So what the tapes revealed was that Halderman had told Nixon about the arrest of the burglars. Nixon was concerned that the burglars were going to divulge information that was classified and uh, create problems for him. And he was really concerned about the uh, what he called the, the Cuban... Uh, problem, which was their connection to Cuba. Also, he was worried that they would divulge information about the Ellsberg break-in. And so what Nixon told Haldeman, who was then chief of staff, to do was to uh, try to interfere in the FBI investigation and get the FBI to stop investigating. And so obviously that's obstruction of justice. So the House Judiciary Committee passed three articles of impeachment, including obstruction of justice, uh, set to have a full House vote two weeks after that uh, in late July. So two weeks would have been mid-August. And uh, before that House vote actually happened, Nixon resigned. Uh, Barry Goldwater, and I think actually it was Mark Hatfield or one of the Oregon senators, uh, went to visit um, Nixon at the White House in the, that first week of August and basically told him, if the House impeaches and it moves to the Senate, we don't have the votes to acquit you. We're, we're going to have a lot of Republican senators also join the Democrats in impeaching you. And uh, Nixon decided before that happened, he was going to uh, reserve what little of his dignity he had left and resign the presidency. And he, he resigned in 1974. Good evening. This is the 37th time... I have spoken to you from this office, where so many decisions have been made that shape the history of this nation. Each time I have done so to discuss with you some matter that I believe affected the national interest. In all the decisions I have made in my public life, I have always tried to do what was best for the nation. Throughout the long and difficult period of Watergate, I have felt it was my duty to persevere, to make every possible effort to complete the term of office to which you elected me. In the past few days, however, it has become evident to me that I no longer have a strong enough political base in the Congress to justify continuing that effort. I would have preferred to carry through to the finish whatever the personal agony it would have involved. And my family unanimously urged me to do so. But the interests of the nation must always come before any personal considerations. From the discussions I have had with congressional and other leaders, I have concluded that because of the Watergate matter, I might not have the support of the Congress that I would consider necessary to back the very difficult decisions and carry out the duties of this office in the way the interests of the nation will require. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. America needs a full-time president and a full-time Congress, particularly at this time with problems we face at home and abroad, to continue to fight through the months ahead for my personal vindication 
would almost totally absorb the time and attention of both the President and the Congress in a period when our entire focus should be on the great issues of peace abroad and prosperity without inflation at home. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. So the resignation happened. Uh, the whole thing wasn't quite done yet. Uh, there was going to be a continuing trial, but uh, the new president, Gerald Ford, decided to give Nixon a full pardon in September 1974. Uh, the result of this was uh, that Republicans were extremely damaged and uh, they, they were hit hard. They, they, they suffered a lot of losses, one of the worst midterm losses uh, that they suffered in recent U.S. history in the 1974 midterm elections. Uh, Ford's own election prospects, he was never elected vice president, he was appointed, so when he ran for full election for president in uh, 1976, uh, his own prospects were diminished. Uh, he himself blamed the pardon for being a reason why he lost the 1976 election. And Richard Nixon's reputation never fully recovered. Uh, he tried to rehabilitate himself. He wrote a lot of books. He became a prolific author uh, in his later years. And he was a, a trusted advisor for Ronald Reagan at, at various points in the 1980s. But uh, in general, he was never able to recover the uh, the dignity that he once had. And... Uh, it always had that stain of Watergate, and so historians have written about him. You know, there's that all, Watergate's always going to dog him, no matter what good you say about his presidency. And lately, people have been reevaluating. Uh, historians have been reevaluating his presidency more positively. But no matter what you say about it, it's always got that Watergate asterisk. Uh, a lot of people were charged. Uh, 41 people ended up going to jail, and 48 were found guilty of uh, various crimes. Uh, I think the, most of them served jail sentences between one and two years. G. Gordon Liddy, I think, served four years. Uh, the legal profession was damaged. Most of these people were lawyers, and it made lawyers look really bad. And so uh, there was new regulation uh, against, uh, against lawyers. The long-term impacts of Watergate were significant in a number of ways. So the Pentagon Papers had already done a lot to cause people to lose faith in the government. Um, between the period 1932 and 1968, there was somewhat of a sense that working in government was a good thing, at least not a bad thing. <laughs> Uh, that you could be a government official, be a politician, and be focused on something good. And the New Deal had helped, and Roosevelt had, had helped propagate that idea. John F. Kennedy helped bring it back. You know, he said, "What can? Uh, don't ask what uh, your country can do for you. What ask what you can do for your country." And so there was this sense of uh, service that, uh, in the period 1930s, 1960s came along with working in, in government and politics to some extent. Uh, basically, people didn't hate politicians as much as they do now. That really changed because of Vietnam and then Watergate. A lot of people came to believe, a lot of Americans came to believe that government was just inherently corrupt and couldn't be trusted. And, you know, look at what happened in Vietnam and, and look at what happened in Watergate. And it was hard to argue against that. It also defined journalism for more than a generation, for two generations probably, what journalists were supposed to be and what they were supposed to do and what their job was. Uh, the best example is the the movie All the President's Men, which was based on Woodward and Bernstein's activities in uncovering Watergate. And you actually see this kind of image of newsrooms in movies for the next 20 years or 30 years. I, I remember in the 2000s, any movie that depicts any journalists, it kind of looks like this. Um, and journalists were kind of seen as these hunters of information to take powerful people down. So, 
after Watergate, any political scandal imaginable became called a whatever gate. And journalists, both journalists and politicians wanted to unearth the gates, so to speak, uh, open the gates of, uh, what Watergate could do because Watergate made people's careers. Woodward and Bernstein, obviously, but anybody who started working on the Watergate story became famous as a result of following it. Uh, A good example is the TV reporter, Leslie Stahl, who, uh, was assigned Watergate early on. And she initially thought it was going to hurt her career because it was so boring, but then it ended up making her this famous reporter. And so the culture of journalism really did change significantly. Uh, you think of what reporters were supposed to do and what kind of people they were you, you imagined when you think of a reporter after Watergate, Woodwin and Bernstein became kind of the ultimate reporter archetypes, even the way they dressed, uh, even modern productions. Like you see something like house of cards, um, the way the reporters dress is based on kind of how Woodwin and Bernstein dressed. And so they kind of set the reporter style for a long time. Watergate did inspire a flurry of ethics laws and campaign finance laws, which a lot of those are still with us. A lot of the things politicians have to do to check their boxes to be compliant uh, have to do with various ethics restrictions that were put in place to try to keep a Watergate from happening again. Another significant outcome of Watergate was that the Republican Party, the, the conservative wing of it, said, we told you Nixon was no good. And now we've been proven very much right. And so the conservative wing basically said no more Nixons. Uh, Nixon had had too much of a tendency to compromise with uh, liberals on inconvenient issues. So for example, Nixon was more than willing to get rid of the electoral college. Uh, Based on his experience in 1968, he saw that a handful of votes could have changed the entire electoral college vote, and so he was willing to get rid of it. Uh, Conservatives weren't so comfortable with that. Uh, Nixon was fine with um, the the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, He supported that, even though the president isn't relevant in the passage of a congressional or or of a constitutional amendment. But Nixon was okay with that. Um, Nixon was anti-communist to the extreme uh, in terms of rhetoric, but uh, in terms of being strong in the Cold War and standing up to the Soviets, but when it came to domestic policy, he wasn't always, uh, didn't always hold to the conservative orthodoxy. And so the Republicans shifted considerably after that. They nominated Ronald Reagan uh, in 1980 and pretty much continued uh, in that mold going forward. So, you know, what's... What's the end game here? Can we have another Watergate? Will anything like Watergate ever happen again? Yes, I think we'll have political scandals again uh, that bring politicians or or that make a lot of trouble for politicians. We obviously just had something kind of similar that resulted in Donald Trump's impeachment that had some uh, similarities with Watergate. But in general, I don't think it'll exactly happen. For one people paid a lot of attention to the Watergate hearings that they just don't pay attention now. Uh, It's estimated that 80% of Americans watched one of the hearings uh, from the the televised Senate hearings of Watergate. And so it was kind of this cultural touchstone of the 1970s that you watched those hearings. The way the media landscape is now and going to be, I don't think that'll ever happen again. Um, The impeachment hearings of Donald Trump got mildly good ratings, like 13, 15 million people watch those. Um, That's about equivalent to a football game, uh, a regular season football game, not not even a uh, playoff one. So NFL game. So uh, I don't think that Americans, the American public will care that much. Uh, even if something as bad as Watergate happens. And then the the partisanship of the Congress probably won't allow it to happen again. In modern times, Nixon would not have resigned, uh, and his party would not have abandoned him. So it's likely we're going to get more political scandals, but I don't think a resignation like like Nixon's will happen again. But it certainly uh, defined...
U.S. politics for a long time. You see it across culture, and you see this kind of dis- lack of faith in the presidency reflect in a lot of 1970s culture. Um, for example, comic books. There was a story arc around the same time in the mid 1970s where, uh, in Marvel Comics, Captain America decides to stop being Captain America because uh, he he's so disenchanted with the corruption in the government that he can't bear to wear the flag anymore. So uh, you, you saw it across a lot of uh, a lot of pop culture at the time. Um, the term "follow the money." Uh, that came out of Watergate and specifically it came out of the all, uh, all the president's men movie. Uh, and it's done some good things, some bad things uh, the good thing about it, I think is that journalists are very interested in holding public figures feet to the fire. Um, the downside of that is I think that sometimes they get too overzealous in trying to make themselves famous in the process. But we do want the press to uh, keep public figures on their toes. And so that, uh, in, in that sense, I think it did uh, it did accomplish something that, uh, uh, that was positive going forward despite all the, the Sherman, Sturman drang of it. So... That is my discussion of Watergate. I want to thank the uh, library for uh, hosting this and uh, thank all of uh, the audience for, for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it.